Good morning, greetings, friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, Pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I specialize in using nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and often deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your vitality and health and well-being, and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be. But you don't know where to begin. You have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more knowledgeable. You are more and more in control of your body. And you know you can overcome any health issue. That's why we're here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 29 years of practicing pharmacy, I have seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes and hypertension and obesity and skin diseases like acne, psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure because the human body is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment to moment basis. And while some folks may call that healing, renewing, regenerating system a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, the longevity products, formulations, ingredients, skincare, we welcome your phone calls. If you have a success story you want to share or if you want to contribute to the conversation, likewise, we'd love to hear from you. 844-236-6010 is our number, 844-236-6010. We have a guest coming up in the bottom of the hour. Dr. Shoshana Bennett will be talking about postpartum depression. She's a clinical psychologist and an author, and uh, she's written a book, Postpartum postpartum depression for dummies plus another one beyond the blues understanding and treating prenatal and postpartum depression did you know ppd postpartum depression also affects dads 10 percent of new fathers uh, 10 percent of new dads uh, suffer from postpartum depression anyway shoshana bennett will be coming up at the bottom of the hour talking about ppd postpartum depression uh, and then we'll take your calls in our second segment, our next segment. So please call in early, 844-236-6010. So we get to as many calls as possible. If you're interested in purchasing any of the Ingevi products you hear advertised on the program or recommended on the program, please head over to brightsideben.com. You can also purchase products from pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com. Those are my blogs. We update them regularly with news stories as well as posts. Thank you to Robert Lundgren and Jaunty Collier for setting those up. If you're interested in purchasing any of the Truth products, my Truth Skin Health products, including the Retinol 5% Gel for hyperpigmentation, for acne, for wrinkles and fine lines, Retinol is amazing stuff. As you know, if you've been listening to this program for the last month or so, we've been talking a lot about vitamin A and retinol, and we'll continue talking about it because it's one of the most effective skin lightening, topical skin lightening ingredients you could use. Anyway, 5% retinol with Lots of juicy, fat-soluble, premium, stabilized vitamin C. No preservatives, no fragrances, no emulsifiers. Just what you need. Only, only ingredients that your skin can use. Active and functional ingredients. TruthTreatmentProducts.com. Truth Treatments. Truth Treatment Products. I'm sorry. TruthTreatments.com. 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 Okay. We're talking skin lightening. We're talking melasma, hyperpigmentation, dark patches on the skin. Not really spots. They're more like patches on your skin. And we're talking about how melasma and skin lightening, how they are are an aspect of overall health, overall skin health and overall bodily health. In fact, the stress response, cortisol, stress hormones, these are... Uh, The stress response is what is behind hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation is a manifestation of a body in distress, like all health issues are a manifestation of a body in distress. And like all skin health issues are the manifestation of a body in distress. As we said yesterday, it's hidden in the word dis-ease. If you're dealing with a skin dis-ease, you're dealing with a body out of ease, a body in distress. If you're dealing with a chronic degenerative dis-ease. You're dealing with a body out of ease, a body that's in stress. Skin conditions are rooted for the most part, 99% of the time, skin conditions are rooted in internal causes. And we'll be taking some time talking about internal and nutritional and dietary strategies to keep your skin pigment glowing and healthy and responsive 
uh, in a healthy way, responsive in a healthy way, that is, because you can have responsive in a non-healthy way. But we're going to be talking about how you can keep your skin responsive to nutrition and responsive to dietary strategies, responsive to supplements in a healthy way, and also responsive to the sun in a healthy way. Topically, however, because melasma is obviously on top of the skin, there are ways that you can address hyperpigmentation, melasma, with a select group of anti-pigmenting agents, skin lightening agents, most of which, unfortunately, are toxic, at least in high enough doses. They're basically medication. We talked about something called hydroquinone. That's the gold standard of skin lighteners. Here's the thing. The body wants to, to, uh, to pigment the skin for a reason. It's part of the stress response, and there's chemistry that's initiated to make the skin darken, make the skin pigment when there's some kind of stress going on. The body wants to pigment, and the only way to shut it down is by being toxic. The only way to shut down something that the body wants to do is to poison it. That's so important, you guys. If the body wants to do something, if the body wants to, to clamp down on the blood vessels so your blood pressure goes up, if the body wants to uh, jack up inflammation to protect itself, if the body wants to darken the skin as a manifestation of the stress response, the only way to, to stop that from happening is to poison it. That's how drugs work. The only way to lower your blood pressure if the body decides it wants to raise the blood pressure is to shut it down, is to poison it. The only way to suppress inflammation if the body feels like it needs to be inflamed is to poison it, is to shut it down. The only way to suppress pigmentation if the body wants to darken the skin is to poison the pigmentation system. You can't force your will or the doctor's will. We cannot force our will on the body. The body is much smarter than your doctor, and it should be. The body is much smarter than we are, and it should be. The body has a wisdom and an intelligence that needs to be respected. We have to work with the body, not against the body. If we're hyperpigmenting, if we're, our, 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 pigment, our pigmentation on our skin is increasing, the body wants that to happen. And the only way to, to counteract that is to shut it down, to poison it. And that's why hydroquinone and, and skin lightening drugs, for the most part, are poisonous. Now, you can have milder poisons, and those are certainly going to be better than something like hydroquinone, but still, you're suppressing something that the body wants to do. Hydroquinone in particular is really, really toxic stuff. If you were to drink your hydroquinone or eat your hydroquinone, you probably have to have your stomach pumped. Hydroquinone only works really effectively at higher concentrations. It's unstable. It breaks down. It smells. It's really nasty stuff. We've talked about this at length. I used to make it in my lab high uh, in the pharmacy, a compounding pharmacy. I used to have to make high concentrations of hydroquinone. I would wear a mask. And when that prescription came in for 20 or 10% of hydroquinone from the plastic surgeon's office, I would dread it a little bit because I knew I was going to be breathing in carcinogenic and mutagenic and toxic stuff. Throughout history, for some reason, women have been willing to do whatever it takes to lighten their skin. Skin lightening has historically meant killing cells. Hydroquinone is just the most, most recent toxic skin lightener. But throughout history, there have been all kinds of things that women have done to lighten their skin. Because pigmentation of the skin is so darn important. Melanin is very, very electrical stuff. That's how melanin really works, or at least one of the ways it works, is that it dampens electrical energy from the sun. So the only way you're going to keep pigmentation from occurring, if the body wants it to occur, is to kill the cells that make the pigment, or at least to suppress their chemistry. And women have used mercury to lighten their skin. Mercury basically kills pigment cells, and voila, your skin was light. Problem is, mercury is toxic. And throughout history, a lot of women have been killed by the stuff in their skincare products, although they did have nice porcelain skin on their deathbeds or, or, or in their coffins. Lead was also used in the early days of cosmetics. I'm talking the mid to late 18th century, really as early as the Renaissance period, 1500s. Women were obsessed with the tone of their skin and they would use lead. In fact, there's an interesting his, uh, historical aspect uh, to lead in skin liners. We'll talk about that uh, when we come back from our break or we'll take your phone calls if we've got them at 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. All right, we are back on The Bright Side. 
at Farm Spenny. 442366010 is our number. We got Dr. Shosh, as she calls herself, Dr. Shoshana Bennett, coming up at the bottom of the hour. We're going to talk postpartum depression, which is not just a female issue, as it turns out. Dr. Shoshana will be telling us about the 10% of men that deal with postpartum depression. That's coming up in the bottom of the hour. We'll take your phone calls, 844-236 in this segment, 844-236-6010 in this segment. And then we'll continue talking about skin lightening, toxic skin lightening, as well as effective skin lightening, non-toxic skin lightening, which also, which uh, involves good nutrition, nutritional supplementation, as well as some dietary strategies. We'll continue with that tomorrow. On the bright side, as we're talking skin health, time to hit our phones, 844-236-6010. Let's go to uh, Dan in Illinois. What's up, Dan? Welcome to the bright side. Hey, how you doing, pharmacist Ben? Hey, buddy. What's up, man? Hey, hey I was just curious. So, um, I'm, I'm doing some research on a blood type diet, and I'm blood type B, and I'm not supposed to be chicken, corn, lentils, peanuts, sesame seeds, tomatoes, and stuff like that. Is there anything? Have you, do you think any? I think it's silly. Or? I think it's really silly. Do you, do you know any animals that eat right for their blood type? Do you ever hear lions or tigers or bears or horses eating right for their blood type in the wild? No. Oh, I can't eat. I'm a, a horse saying, I'm type B. I'm, I'm not going to eat that kind of food. It doesn't happen. You know, no. it, it, theoretically, if you really want to go all out, there's probably something to it uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. If our blood evolved to be a certain type, we also evolved to eat certain foods. But for the most part, it's just much ado about nothing. Just a guy writing a book, basically. Uh, everybody needs B vitamins. Everybody needs vitamin C. Most people should stay away from gluten and, and anything that rags on their digestive system. It's the, the whole eat right for the, for the blood type, it just doesn't make sense to me considering vitamin deficiencies, mineral deficiencies, protein deficiencies, too many calories, too much sugar. All of these affect everyone. Once you, if you are one of the rare, rare, rare people, if there are any people, who is perfectly, perfectly uh, healthy in terms of their nutrition and their digestive system and their blood sugar and their respiratory system, and their oxygenation, if everything is firing on all cylinders, yeah, well, maybe then you want to, if you want to fine tune your, your health care regimen, uh, health regimen, maybe then eat right for your blood type. But for the most part, 99% of people, even more, are all going to be B vitamin deficient, vitamin C deficient, protein deficient. Uh, too much stress, too much sugar, not enough oxygen. This has nothing to do with blood type. So I think that's just really silly stuff. In my humble opinion, and as I say, animals in the wild don't eat right for their blood type. That's just my Thank take you. on it. Does that help? Yeah, I hope I, I, hope I didn't offend you. Didn't mean to offend you. No, I, no, okay, no you're good. Right. <laughs> good deal. Thanks, man. Yeah, you know, Peter Adamo, who wrote the book, he actually has some good things to say about lectins, which we've talked in the past. Lectins are plant uh, or vegetable and, and fruit comp el uh, elements, substances that are they're actually found everywhere, but they're especially highly concentrated in vegetables and fruits and plant material, L-E-C-T-I-N-S, by the way, lectins. And these things are associated with inflammatory health issues, uh, with digestive problems, with immune problems, with arthritis and autoimmune diseases. And you do want to be careful with lectins. I can't tell you how many people I talk to on the phone and even on this program who think that they're eating well because they eat lots of fruits and vegetables and plants and, and grains, forgetting that these things make compounds to prevent us from eating them, poisonous compounds. And some of those these things are lectins, L-E-C-T-I-N-S. So Peter Damo, he's one of the only guys I know that's talking about lectins, and he's right on with that. But when he gets into the eat right for your blood type, and if you're type B, you got to eat these foods, and type A, you got to eat those foods, um, that just doesn't sound right to me. All right. Uh, Michael in Washington, what's going on? Welcome to the Bright Side. Yeah, hey, uh, pharmacist Ben, thank you for taking sure. my call. I'll go real what's quick cooking? here. I don't know how long I've got to go over this, but... Well, Basically, uh, seven years ago, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. Okay. And they took a third of my colon out. Okay. And uh, then they, I went through the chemo, and I almost passed away from that. Make a long story short, after a two-year test, uh, they asked, actually, I was in the infusion room, and I, I almost, almost died. They rushed me to emergency. And anyway... Uh, You're like a cat. You got all these lives, man. Yeah. Well, I, I 
I give God the glory for that. Praise God. Praise God. Because right. I'm not going anywhere unless he allows me to be taken Got it. out. Got but it, man. How, how old are you? I'm 65. You are. We sound good. All right, so here's the deal, okay? You want to cut to the you want to you want to get to the root of things. And well, the root yeah. of th- here's the th- here's what I'm asking. Here's why okay. I'm calling. Okay. Um, basically through Dr. Wallach's uh, protocol, uh, I I got on his protocol a year ago. And a year and a half and I've been on, you know, I changed my diet. And so basically I I got better. Uh, cause I was sick for, even after the cancer diagnosis, I got, uh, you know, I st- continued to be sick. So in a, in a year and a half, I reversed the colon problem, my stomach problem. That's awesome. I also got kidney disease, third stage kidney disease, which I also reversed through my diet. And That's Dr. awesome, Wallace. man. Good job. Okay. But, 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 all right. I got so fed up with the medical doctors that I didn't want to return to them for my health. So I would okay. order my blood from them online and say, I'd like to get my blood checked. All right. But they did that for a short period of time, but then the next time I said, I want to get my blood, uh, and it would come back perfect. The blood was perfect. Then he said, no, you're going to have to come in. So I said, well, all right, I'll come in. And so they did, a, did my blood work, did my urine, and my blood work came back great, but my urine did, and it was, but there was no bacteria. You got to, you got to ask me. We only got about a minute here. You got to ask okay. me. How can I help you? I got. Well, they diagnosed me with inflamed red blood cells and white blood cells. All right. And he put me on uh, antibiotics. All right. Well, hang on, hang on, Michael, because I only got about a minute here. But it's not that difficult. The problem is, is you still have inflammation in there. Okay, it doesn't matter where the inflammation is. You got inflammation. You probably have it all over your body, not just in your blood. What does inflammation mean? Inflammation is a protective response. All right, does that make sense? Yes. Your only issue is what is your body trying to protect itself from? And there could be at this point, at the age of 65, with all the breakdown you got going on, it could be a lot of things. But for the most part, your body's protecting itself from something you're eating. All right, you're not an IV drug user, all right? So you're not it's not protecting itself from something you're injecting. There may be something you're breathing, but for the most part, what gets into your body that initiates this inflammatory protective response is food. Considering the fact that we're all existing on food that didn't exist 200 years ago, you know, we're all eating modern day food, it's not surprising that your body, our bodies would be reacting that way. So what you want to do is give yourself a food holiday. Take two or three days off from food completely fast. If you absolutely positively are miserable when you're fasting, do a little swear of V. Get yourself some of that swear of V and maybe do half a bottle every hour, every two What's hours. That? Just to, uh, It's a longevity product. It's called swear of V. I'll spell it for you. Swear, S- Let me spell it for you, okay? S is in Sam, U E R O. V-I-E, swear of V. It's a fermented whey product. It'll give you a lot of energy. It's got electrolytes in there. It's got probiotics in there. And maybe do half a bottle every couple of hours when you're fasting. Then you're going to reintroduce foods, and then you're going to have to notice which foods cause a flare-up in your condition. You know what, Michael? I'm out of time, but I'd love to talk to you. Uh, if you want to call back tomorrow, we'll get you first up. Or if you want to contact me in person, send an email to ben at ksco.com and put your phone number in there, and I'll get back to you. We're back on the Bright Side. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 Central Time. All our programs are archived at brightsideben.com. Also, benfuchsarchives.com if you miss a show or if you want to review a program or uh, if you have a specific topic you want to want to review. They're all searchable and they're all posted at brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. Also, if you want to purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised on the program, please call the Brightside Ben phone team at 866-735-2470. 866-735-2470. All right. I'm excited to have our next guest on, Dr. Shosh, as she calls herself. Dr. Shoshana Bennett is a uh, psychologist and she writes about postpartum depression, PPD, the most common complication of childbirth. This year, 1.3 million expectant and new mothers are gonna experience postpartum depression, and it doesn't just involve women, as it turns out. It also affects 10% of new fathers, and uh, 
we'll talk to Dr. Shosh about postpartum depression. Greetings. Welcome to The Bright Side, Dr. Shoshana Bennett. Thanks so much. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into uh, the specifics of PPD. Well, I, I got into this field based on personal experience. I was a special education instructor working at community colleges in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then I had a baby. And I sunk into this horrifying place. I uh, never knew that mental state existed. Mm. And I really lost myself. And there was no help back then. We're talking about the 1980s. Nobody was talking about this. I just thought I was the most terrible mother on the face of the earth. And, you know, I went through two suicidal depressions. If I can go here, so to wow. speak, anybody can. It's, uh, it was really horrifying. And, um, no, uh, no history I, of depression. Just to clarify, no history no, of depression no or anxiety. No history of depression. There was depression in my family history um, okay. uh, in, in various generations. But, of course, nobody asked me questions like that. You know, there was nothing of relevance that ever came up in any, anybody's office. Um, and uh, what I finally realized after, you know, I was still in the, in the depths of my uh, the second uh, uh, de- postpartum depression after the birth of my second child, um, I finally realized there was a name for this. And I became both furious at the medical profession and the mental health profession. I can like, relate. so I common, relate. right? Yeah. One in yeah, yeah. seven women go through something more severe than the very normal baby blues. You know, where, why had my family and I been allowed to suffer? And that's what really launched me uh, into this uh, uh, career, and I helped to pioneer the field in the United States, and uh, it led me here to your show. Okay. All right, good. I love that. Now, now I love how you say back in the 1980s. Was it really that long ago? The, it, it actually was. From a medical perspective, we didn't know a lot of the stuff that we know today back in the 1980s, even though, you know, we can remember what we had for lunch probably, you know, back in the 1980s. I got ties, <laughs> neckties that old. But it, it was a long we, time ago. We've come a long way since We've then, come a yeah. long way. Uh, now, you said something very interesting. You said the normal baby blues. So is yeah. there a distinction between postpartum depression and what you're calling the normal baby blues? Uh, yes, and there are two major ways you can tell the difference between normal new mom stuff and and the disorder of postpartum depression. One is in the duration of the symptoms, how long they last following mm. the delivery. Uh, a baby blues is not only mild; it doesn't feel good, but it's it, but it's mild. The woman is still functioning. The, the you know, and uh, but the the baby blues should be gone by about two weeks. Uh, postpartum. Is it organic? Is it, is it biochemically related, yes. what you're calling the we, baby blues? The etiology, uh, uh, the, the major etiology of baby blues, yes, is hormonal. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, certainly, certainly sleep deprivation and a lot of other factors yeah. can, can feed into it. But, yes, it's primarily hormonal in, in cause, we believe. So that's one way we tell the difference. So if the baby blues doesn't go away, if it continues and continues, we now call it postpartum uh-huh. depression, even if it's very mild. The other way you tell the difference is by the severity of the symptoms. As in my case, once that placenta was delivered, I plummeted immediately. Mm. So it, it overlapped that first couple of weeks, you know, the baby blues period, but the severity of the symptoms were such that it truly got in the way of, of my daily functioning and also my ability to sleep at night when I had the, the chance to sleep. Now, did you have the same issues with your second, did you have a second baby, I, I should did. ask you? Yes, and, and I had, had depressions after, after both. We do know that once we've, once we've experienced one uh, postnatal illness, postpartum illness, such as postpartum depression, we're very quick to do it again. We're extremely high risk, about 80% risk, unless you've got a very solid wellness strategy in place. And because I was never diagnosed the first time, you know, my, my body just instantly, that's what my brain chemistry did. I just was, was uh, uh, you know, I shot directly into that second depression. But the great news is there's a tremendous amount we can do. I'm all about prevention. And, uh, you know, uh, women don't need to have that, that same experience with subsequent deliveries if they have a good plan uh, in place. Okay. Now, when you talk about prevention uh, and you talk about treatment, are we talking psychological, psychological aspects or are we talking physiological? Are we talking both? Are we talking diet, nutrition, medication? What do you mean by prevention and what do you mean by intervention? So, uh, yes to all the above. It's, it, there's no cookie-cutter approach here. So every woman who contacts me gets a complete assessment. And uh, there are certainly some, there are key components, there are key factors to this wellness puzzle. Uh, but I think psychotherapy is uh, on the top. I mean, it, working with a perinatal 
uh, psychotherapist, somebody who truly understands this specialty of what is going on either during pregnancy or, or postpartum uh, and the specifics of what that illness can look like. It's very, very important. So that's on top. Certainly something to oxygen. Well, hang on, brain. hang on. Before you go on, let's sure. I want to, can I just touch on that real quickly? Because sure. I hear that term all the time, and I know my listeners hear it all the time, but we don't really know what it means, psychotherapy. Is that a specific type of treatment, or are you talking just general psychological therapy? Or is there a specific talking, thing called psychotherapy? Yeah, so, so very specifically, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most important talk therapies. So I'm talking about finding a psychologist, finding a marriage and family therapist, but somebody who has specific training in maternal mental illness. That's what, so, I, that's what I'm referring to. It's, it's so, mainly talk therapy. There are many other types of treatments and therapies. Uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly there are uh, uh, physical treatments. There's brain stimulation. There's well, hang, hang, I want to talk about this psychotherapy thing. You're talking about yeah. like the standard kind of stereotype where you lay on the couch and you talk about your childhood. <laughs> Is that what no, you're No, that, that's pretty much, well, not completely gone, but I'm, ter- I'm not terribly much in favor of that type of uh, psychoanalysis, and that's, uh, uh, okay. uh, that's not appropriate. It here, women who are going through this type of illness, or anybody going through a, a postpartum mental illness, needs a very practical strategy: how to put one foot in front of the other. So, so lying on somebody's couch and and, and just talking about what's that going on. That doesn't happen anymore. To, that doesn't happen. Does that not you know, happen? It anymore? doesn't happen as much. That's kind of uh, on its way out. Um, okay. And, uh, no, that's the <laughs> that's that's a more a stereotype. With the German doctor, with the German or Austrian doctor talking. <laughs> yeah. Tell me and about your childhood. That's not what a woman with postpartum depression uh, okay. needs right. at the moment. She'd probably no. kill the guy. She'd probably kill him. <laughs> no, I don't know. if She'd do that. But I. But what's if it's hormonal, as you mm-hmm. said. How would psychotherapy, how would psychological techniques work with a hormonal, a hormonal well, issue? And therapy. Yeah, we've got a great question. We can you hang on, though, do- Dr. Show? She's got to hang on. We've got to take a break. Okay, we'll come sure. back and, and talk about that. I also want to talk about men. That's, I find that very fascinating that you said 10% of new fathers also deal with PPD. We're talking to Dr. Shoshana Bennett about postpartum depression. Her book is Postpartum Depression for Dummies and Beyond the Blues. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We'll be back right after this. Okay, we are back on the bright side. I am pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're talking to Dr. Shoshana Bennett, Dr. Shosh, as she uh, goes by. And we're talking postpartum depression. Dr. Shoshana, Dr. Shosh, can you give out your website real quick before I forget? And, uh, and, and if people want to get a hold of you or get a hold of your Thank books. Thank you. Yes, drshosh.com, D-R-S-H-O-S-H.com. And it's very easy to reach me. You know, you had asked a question before the break uh, regarding, you know, if this is hormonal. Or, or, or why does psychotherapy work? Would you like right. me to? Yeah, no, yeah. We have excellent research um, showing that really good psychotherapy changes brain chemistry. And uh, now, is that all the woman needs? Usually not. I mean, she's got to have a very solid plan for sleep at night. So, because uh, sleep deprivation itself can cause depression in sure. anybody, for that matter, it lowers their serotonin. You know, excellent nutrition like omega threes, folic acid, uh, you know, D three, all all of that good stuff. And again, I'm not giving medical advice here. I'm just saying that this this kind of an assessment needs to be done. And oh, and by the way, on the on the note of omega threes, a lot of women, pregnant and lactating women, especially, will say, oh, oh I don't want the mercury. I'm not going to do fish oil. You know, I trust Nordic Naturals. You know, use a. Use I like a, Nordic Naturals. Yeah, we talk about yeah, that. Yeah, Nordic Natural. You know, I trust the manufacturing, and I'm a I'm a purist when it comes to that. So you don't have to worry about you know anybody getting harmed, quite the contrary. It, it's excellent for, for children's development. It's fantastic for, for treatment and also prevention of, of mental health issues for the pregnant woman and, and, and the new mom. You know, she how about needs seed omega- support. How about I'm seed sorry? sources of omega-3s, chia and flax and that kind of thing? We need the... The, the DHA? There are, yeah, you know, there, Nordic Naturals, I know, uh, offers vegan uh, uh, support also. It, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the DHA and the EPA. I'm most familiar with, with the fish oil, so whenever possible, that's what I do 
recommend. But but Nordic, I know, offers a variety for vegans, for those who don't eat fish, for those who don't want that in their body. Uh, and uh, so you've got a you know you've got an array, and you can also get some free samples. I've just noticed on on the website. Mm. So nice. absolutely. But you know, the woman also needs again a plan for emotional support. Who does she have to talk to? Who does she have to lean on? I mean, a mom who moves from Texas to California and all of her support network is in another state. She's going to. She's very high risk. So there are so, psychosocial factors as well, not only the the biochemical. Now, how does it that ten percent of men get it if it's if it's hormonal and there's estrogen and progesterone and right. I assume you're talking female hormones? What's up with the ten percent so, of new fathers? Certainly, uh, this, you know when fathers get uh, a, a postpartum depression, it's not due to the reproductive hormones, of course. But if he, uh, yes, so men men get depressed at a rate of about ten percent. This can be also sleep deprivation. Dads are very involved uh, with taking care of their their babies uh, these days. Also, if he's high risk himself, if he's had a personal history or a family history of depression, mm. um, extra stress. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of stress, even though he might be feeling joy as well. I mean, there's there's often the financial stress. There's there's, and if the mom is depressed, the, his rate actually shoots up. His risk rate shoots up between 24 and 50 percent. And sometimes I get calls from moms, you know, saying, you know, I'm really doing okay, but my, you know, my husband isn't. My my partner looks like he's falling apart. So you know, he can be depressed even when she's not. But if she is, his rate shoots uh, way up. Any, have you guys done any research, or do you know of any research associated with, uh, with health implications or complications for the child that are associated Absolutely. with parents? Who, yeah? yeah. Tell us a little yeah, bit with, about that. With, with, I'm, I'm assuming you mean with untreated depression. You know, if the moms are depressed, if moms yeah. or, or dads suffer from PPD, postpartum yeah. depression, does that have it, are there any implications for the child's future you development or health be, issues? Yes. Yeah, there, there, there can be... Uh, all kinds of developmental problems, all kinds of neurological problems, attachment disorders. Mm. Uh, I mean, my own daughter, I, I was so ill, and I won't launch into everything that happened, but I was, uh, here I was teaching early childhood uh, uh, development at community colleges, but I, as a mom, I was so ill. I could not get eye contact with By my ill, daughter. you mean depressed. Is that what you're talking about when you say very ill? Very depressed, and it is uh -huh. an illness. I mean, it, it absolutely yeah. is. A, it's a very real diagnosable illness. Right. So she, she developed a, an attachment disorder. And, yes, children who, um, whose parents, at least one parent, is depressed um, ha and who goes untreated, um, uh, those, those kids are usually depressed by age 15, and they can have all kinds wow. of other, other issues. Actually, that's why I, I wrote Children of the Depressed, so that adult children who have been raised by at least one depressed parent can get themselves on their feet and, and move wow. on so it doesn't become, you know, doesn't continue to be this generational issue. But I don't want, I'm not, I'm not the voice of doom here. Even if uh, uh, th that is going on, there is always hope, and the kids can get the help that they need. And uh, the parents should just get help as fast as they possibly can. It's the most loving and responsible thing a parent can do, not yeah. only for themselves, but for everybody they love. Now, is, is postpartum depression a type of PTSD, would you say? No, there can be, uh, PTSD can certainly cause depression. Um, there is a postpartum post-traumatic stress disorder. That's one of the six perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. It's a mouthful. We call them PMADs. Uh, postpartum depression is one. PTSD uh, is another. It can happen from the birth itself. Now, can they overlap? You bet. Um, uh, certainly there can be a, a, a traumatic events that are, that are triggered. Uh, at our most vulnerable time, you know, during during uh, the perinatal period, um, or um, uh, it can it can be due to the due to the childbearing itself, due to the childbirth itself. So now, what? It, what yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. What I was thinking is, are the interventions that are recommended for postpartum depression applicable to folks who are dealing with PTSD from other reasons? Well, often, again, the, these these therapies can often do all, all, all at once. For instance, a woman who is suffering from a postpartum depression, um, uh, uh, she might also have some PTSD or not. Maybe it's just the PTSD that she's going for treatment for. Uh, some of the energy psychology techniques, for instance, the, the tapping or the EMDR, can that what, also What about depression? tapping? And yes. Don't tell, let's talk about that real quick, because I've always wondered about that, tapping and EMDR, uh, uh, eye muscle, what does EMDR stand for? Eye something or another? Movement. 
rapid desensitization. I mean, yeah, how, I'm out of order, but that's that's what it is. How does that yeah, work this, for? This, yeah, tell us about that. I'll talk about well, that a little bit. And again, I am not. I'm. I don't do EMDR. I know practitioners who do, and it's tremendously useful for PTSD, especially um, uh, no matter what the cause. You know, whether it's whether it's a postpartum issue or, or a war veteran, uh, what it's doing is helping the the um, uh, uh, the brain chemistry. It's really it's really helping the two hemispheres of the brain talk to each other, and it's going right to the limbic brain, which is the reptilian brain, the one that holds the emotion. Because when we have PTSD, we don't know uh, our body is having these flashbacks, like these kinesthetic flashbacks, and also we might visually we forget where we are. I mean, we get so it thinks it's real. Your body thinks you're actually exactly. going through these. Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, so 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 our body is is somewhere in the past, kind of reliving, uh, uh, you know, a past traumatic event or period of time. So these kinds of um, uh, therapies. So, and I write about this. There's a whole there's a whole chapter in postpartum depression for dummies that talks about alternative alternative treatments. Now, if what do you think about medicine? What do you think about medication, antidepressants, yeah. Prozac, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, and you just mentioned almost the title of another book. Uh, if I might mention, Pregnant on Prozac, was, I was asked to write that because women were so afraid and wondering, oh, my gosh, can I be on a medication? The data we have, and again, I'm, I'm, I've got to say I'm no big lover of big pharma, but when we need a medication, if a woman truly needs a medication to, to be uh, 100% herself, she should take it. And we have enough data uh, to know that uh, uh, depression crosses the placenta. And it, so that we know is not good for uh, developing babies. Uh, and certainly we, we have a plethora of information about maternal depression and how that can affect, uh, how that can affect children. So if she needs a medication, I'd say do it. It's very individual, though. Again, sometimes just with a plan of action of sleep and exercise and physical support and emotional support and great nutrition, you know, like the omega-3s, um, uh, et cetera, that uh, by itself often is enough to carry her or, or with some of the other natural treatments. But again, very individual, no cookie cutter approach here. Whatever each person needs in order to be 100% well, that's what she needs to do. Any link to specific foods and postpartum depression or uh, diet, specific you know, diets? Uh, you know, it's keeping the blood sugar even, nibbling really uh -huh. great protein throughout the day. Uh, that can also help to keep the moods more stable. Uh, if you're talking about prevention, we don't have real data that would, that would uh, uh, that, you know, that, that says eat this and you won't get depressed. There's certainly mm. no guarantee. But can you help to help to prevent or, or at least minimize the severity of a bout but with nutrition? Doc. Absolutely. The Doc, doctor, we're, we're out of time, Doc. Oh, we're out of okay. time. Give your website out real quick and, and tell folks how they can hold you. You've got about 10 seconds. DrShosh.com, D-R-S-H-O-S-H.com. You can reach me any possible way through that website. Thank you so much, Dr. Shoshana Bennett. Great to talk to you. We'll talk to you again, I hope, soon. All right, take care. That was Dr. Shoshana Bennett, postpartum psychologist. Thanks for listening, friends. I'm pharmacist Ben. Have a spectacular, beautiful day. We'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.